Welcome back to This Week in Immigration. I'm your host, Jack Malde, Associate Director at the Bipartisan Policy Center. In this week's episode, BBC's Senior Advisor, Teresa Cardinal-Brown, chats with Michael Clements, Professor of Economics at George Mason University, who has studied the economic causes and effects of migration all over the world. His latest research, based on a detailed examination of border crossing data, shows that offering more lawful pathways to immigrants reduces unlawful border crossings. Teresa and Michael also talk about the importance of good data for evaluating immigration policies and how traditional understandings of the linkages between migration and development may not be correct. Stay tuned to hear more. Congress once again last week attempted to pass legislation to update border and asylum policy, but failed on a largely party line vote in the Senate. However, the border and what policies are needed to address migration at the southern border remain a topic of significant debate in the lead up to the November election. Despite the elevated political rhetoric, our guest this week has spent his career using data and economic analysis to evaluate migration policies, and his research has upended some long held beliefs about the causes and influences on international migration. Michael Clemens is a professor of economics at George Mason University and a non resident senior fellow at the Peterson Institute for International Economics. For 20 years prior to those appointments, Michael built the research program on international migration at the Center for Global Development in Washington, D.C. He's also affiliated with the IZA Institute of Labor Economics in Bonn, Germany, the Center for Research and Analysis of Migration in the Department of Economics at University College London, and he still maintains an affiliation with the Center for Global Development. He is widely published in academic publications, and his research won the Royal Economic Society Prize. He's worked with governments of countries around the world and international agencies in the design and evaluation of policies around migration. So with that bio out of the way, welcome to the podcast, Michael. Thank you so much. So you have built a career using economics and data analysis to evaluate various aspects of migration policy across both immigrant receiving and immigrant sending countries. So let's just ask what brought you to this field of work in the first place? Wow. Well, migration is is fascinating. You know, uh, when I was a a kid, I lived in a couple of different countries, uh, some of them poor countries. And also uh, my father's work had him around people from all over the world. And from early on, I got the sense that there's something eternal that springs in the human breast all over the world. Uh, There are smarts, there are innovation, there are strengths and weaknesses everywhere. And even though talent is universal, opportunity is not. And it it was really striking to me how many people I encountered in other countries were at least as good as I was in various dimensions, but didn't have the opportunities I had. And migration changes people's lives. And uh, we put a lot of barriers in the way of migration. And I've gotten the sense over the years that those barriers could be much better designed than they are. Yeah. So as I mentioned in your bio, you spent 20 years working for an organization that studies international development, but you focused on migration. And much of your work has kind of overturned some long-held beliefs of many policymakers that, you know, development investments in out-migration countries would decrease migration. First of all, tell us a little bit about that research, um, what you found, and why do you think policymakers continue to have some of these beliefs? Yes, thank you. I mean, I, I've, I have contributed a little bit of research to that, but there's a, there's a, actually a half century of research from my field of economics and political science, anthropology, geography, sociology, across the social sciences on the relationship between economic development and migration, what happens when relatively poor countries get richer. And there's an idea just firmly implanted in so many people's minds, and I think rightly so, that somehow economic development, greater opportunity overseas substitutes for migration. It it makes it less necessary somehow. And maybe, you know, walk by the Statue of Liberty and see, give me your tired and your poor. And of course, there's this idea that when people are less poor, they'll be less likely to show up. And that that makes sense at at an intuitive level. The thing that I wish that, that more people understood is that from the perspective of many families considering migration, in low-income countries, migration is not just a choice about where to live. It's not, well, do I prefer to be in Honduras or do I prefer to be in Mexico? Or what are the pros and cons? Maybe I prefer to be in the United States. What are the pros and cons? It's much more, to many low-income families, migration is much more like uh, an investment. 
or sometimes like insurance. And then it starts to make sense if you think of them that way. Well, uh, in the United States, who is it that invests more in, say, education? Is it uh, poor people who need it the most and, and richer and richer people are less likely to invest in education because they'll be fine anyway? No, it's the opposite. Richer people invest more in, edu in education. How about insurance? There are poor people the most insured because they have the, the riskiest lives and the most to lose. No, it's richer people have a whole lot more insurance than poorer people. And that's because uh, economic development expands the, the means to migrate. It expands international connections. It expands uh, aspirations. And it is also associated with demographic changes that tend to create youth cohorts that have higher propensities to migrate. All of those things together add up to some observed facts, which are that over the last 70 years, as the large majority of low-income countries have gotten richer, they have not experienced declines in migration. It's been just the opposite. Economic development is associated with much more migration at the national level. And zoom down to the household level and you find the same thing. People have even conducted randomized experiments in giving substantial cash transfers to poor families and then tracking what happened to their migration behavior the next year, 15 years later, 30 years later. All of those are typically positive. When people's lives are improved at the household level, they tend to be more likely to go. And I, I know that's just uh, not intuitive for many people. It's just something we see in the data. Yeah, I mean, obviously, the Biden administration uh, came into office talking a lot about addressing root causes of migration in Central America. And for all the investments they they have managed to get pledges for, uh, we are still seeing pretty significant migration from those countries. So it's, you know, and the, the evidence is, is kind of clear there. It's also true, I think most of us if we think about it, how expensive it is to actually move from one place to another, even if you're moving in town or across the country, um, much less internationally, it's not cheap. And so you have to have some means with which to effectuate a move. And particularly if we're talking about irregular migration, obviously it's, it's quite expensive. We hear a lot about what smugglers charge. So they have to have money from somewhere to pay for that. It's incredibly difficult and expensive. It, it, uh, it is greatly facilitated by having connections overseas, friends and family who have done it before. All of those things are positively associated with income, not negatively associated with them. I talk to people about this a lot, including in the government, and I've had very uh, smart, experienced people look at me and say, look, data, 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 whatever, but I talk to migrants. They literally tell me I left because of poverty, right. and you're telling me that they're lying, they're making that up. And the thing is, no, they're not. But if you're talking to migrants, you are not talking to the poorest people. The poorest people are not able to migrate. And that is, that's a conclusion you can reach by simple observation of the world that is, that is not correct because you're not uh, seeing the people who are not migrating because they're too poor. Right. You're not comparing the migrants versus the non-migrants. Yes. You're just looking at the, those who choose to migrate. Yeah. Um, so your latest research is looking at the impact of policies in influencing migration at the, at the U.S.-Mexico border um, and also seems to find a result that is somewhat counter to the prevailing narrative of many uh, in the policy world. So tell us about this research um, about uh, legal pathways versus irregular migration and what you found. Yeah, so I studied the last 12 years of uh, every man, woman, and child who was encountered at the Southwest border as an inadmissible migrant. And I find that when uh, more people are allowed to cross lawfully uh, in the year thereafter, in each month, uh, fewer people cross unlawfully in the sense that that means that letting more people in at ports of entry, as this administration and prior administrations have been doing in large numbers, uh, substitutes people away from crossing unlawfully in the desert uh, and, and into lawful crossings at, at ports of entry. It, it doesn't bring so many people to the border that it ends up resulting in, in more people crossing lawfully. And as you rightly said, that's just, that's a counterintuitive result to a lot of people. And I've thought about it a, a lot and I've, I've come to the conclusion that it, the root cause of that problem is confusion about uh, what an unlawful migrant is, what, uh, what unauthorized migration is in the U.S. today. Uh, most folks uh, 
talk to them on the sidewalk, uh, they can't explain to you through no fault of their own. Nobody has explained to them uh, who are these people who are coming uh, across the border. 10,000 people per day last December was the all time high. Uh, who are they? Are they unauthorized or not? Or, or are they authorized? Maybe we could take a, a, a just a minute or two, if if, if you don't mind, uh, uh, d- digging into the terminology there, because because people don't have the words to refer to who these people are. Yeah, I mean, well, we'll just take a moment because we've said this on the podcast many, many, many times. Immigration law is highly complicated. It is complicated for even experts to to effectively understand all the parts of it, much less explain it to people who aren't (laughs) experts in the law. And you're right, terminology matters, but it's changed. Um, So the term you use is unauthorized. Oftentimes in the news, you hear people talk about illegal immigrants or illegal immigration or undocumented immigrants. In fact, most of those terms don't have any basis in law. Um, they are they are just terms that people throw around to kind of describe what they feel about certain types of migrants yes. or migration. But when we're talking legally um, under the immigration law, I think the the biggest there there's there's people who try to enter the United States who do not have appropriate visa or documentation to enter. And they so they're can called try- inadmissible. They're called Inad- inadmissible. That's a technical term, which is real and has a definition. Right. And so if you come to a port of entry and you don't have the right visa, or you may have a visa, but you're coming for a purpose different than that visa allows, then you can be denied entry at that point by CBP and um, you're determined to be inadmissible. That is different from somebody who is trying to come into the United States other than at a port of entry, whether it's along the seacoast in a boat from the Caribbean or between ports of entry along the border with Mexico or Canada, for that matter. That is an illegal entry that is a term in immigration law. By definition, entering the United States or trying to enter the United States at any part, any place that's not a lawful port of entry is is a crime. It, It is illegal under immigration law. However, once you have made the entry, it is lawful to ask for asylum. And so that becomes a defense against deportation. And even for somebody who's inadmissible at a port of entry, they can ask for asylum. And that puts them into a process by which they can remain in the United States until that is determined. But that's where that's where the terminology kind of fails us because they don't have a legal status under immigration law they would not otherwise be eligible to enter, but the government knows they're here and they're allowed to remain. So I think exactly. that's a big part of the confusion. So if you if you think of people coming inadmissible to a port of entry and then being waived through as quote unquote illegal, then by definition, waving them through is bringing pe- people illegally into the country. Uh, it's like asking, you know, does putting cheese into bread and grilling it, make a grilled cheese. Like you don't need to do a statistical study of that by definition it's happening. But, but as you just pointed out, that's not the case. Like we're, we're not talking about whether, you know, the Associated Press doesn't use illegal immigrants for ethical reasons. Uh, I'm not talking about ethics here. I'm just talking about facts. Somebody who comes to a port of entry and crosses at the port of entry is not breaking the law when they cross. Somebody who gets conditional parole to pursue an asylum claim or receive humanitarian parole, I, is uh, remains inadmissible, but they are not unlawfully present. Unlawful right. presence is defined as as someone who wasn't admitted or paroled. Right. And people who get humanitarian parole are eligible to apply for employment authorization. People who get uh, who are pursuing an asylum claim can also usually apply for employment authorization. So large fractions of these people. Uh, last month, twenty eight percent of people encountered at the border were encountered at a port, not in the desert. So uh, uh, t- toward a third of the people are coming at the port. The large majority of them are entering with a status that does not make them unlawfully present. And most of them are eligible to apply for employment authorization. Somebody who crosses legally, somebody who is not unlawfully present and is working with an official employment authorization from the federal government is not by any stretch of logic and quote unquote illegal immigrant. And we're not talking about ethical use of language here. We're just talking about facts. Right. So, so what I, what I'm studying is the effect of of lawful releases of migrants at ports of entry, people who did not break the law in the act of crossing, and most of whom are not unlawfully present after crossing. Those lawful releases, when those go up, 
do more people come to the border and cross unlawfully? And the, the opposite is the case. People switch out of the desert, switch out of the river and into the ports when when more opportunities to cross lawfully are present. Yeah. So we're talking about things that this administration has done, like the CBP-1 app appointments at ports of entry, where people yes. are literally waiting months and months in Mexico to try to get one of these appointments because they'd rather do that than cross illegally over the river or through, through the desert. Um, there's also the parole programs for certain countries that allow people to actually fly into the United States with an actual parole and a passport and documents that are other ways. And, you know, the, the theory of the case from this administration, at least how they, how they have described it is that they're providing would be migrants who would otherwise be coming to the border alternatives to that illegal crossing. And And they use them when those opportunities exist, they use them. That's what your research is showing that that actually does make a difference. So I think that that's something that, you know, I think where, where you have, as we talked about, like, people who understand or believe that most of what's happening is between ports of entry. And so far, as you said, a third are coming at ports of entry. We still have a lot that are coming in between. Um, But if that's the only frame that you have and that everybody who's coming in at ports of entry is somehow doing also something nefarious or this administration is allowing that to happen and it's just enticing more people to come. I think that's that's the challenge that a lot of Americans face when kind of trying to evaluate the policies of this administration or previous administration or what's being proposed in Congress is, is it going to, as as I like to say, encourage more migration that is irregular in some way, (laughs) people who are not inadmissible. Um, And and so that's the challenge that I think people are, are trying to come up with. And I think that, look, border policy is really complicated as you've you've done your lifetime of research, the motivations of migrants are mixed, right? There's a lot of different nuances to it that sort of the the conventional wisdom doesn't always take into account. But I think it's important that research like yours, you're not modeling some abstract thing, right? You're looking at actual data, historical data, and said, look, we can see this policy went in place and we can see what happened in the following months. And you can see what has been effective or what hasn't been effective. Um, yes. I think that's that's very important because what data you look at and the timeframes also matter. I, I know we've talked a lot on this podcast about one month of data after one month, you know, the next month's numbers after a policy is in effect. Don't tell you much about the effectiveness of the policy because there are temporary effects. You have sure. to look over a longer period of time to see what policies have, have longer term effects. And I think that's that's also an important factor when you're evaluating effectiveness of policies, right? Absolutely. There's a ton of inertia uh, in, in, in migration behavior around the world. So it tends to come in, in uh, waves and, and ebbs rather than uh, jumping around from minute to minute. Right, right. People who are arriving now made the decision to leave months ago. Yes. And the, the, one of the, the biggest determinants of migration around the world is, uh, is prior migration. Uh, people migrate when somebody they know and trust has shown them that it works and that it can be good. And that that means m- migration tends to snowball. Yeah, so let's let's take a lens back out uh, again. Um, one of your more famous articles um, that you wrote in the Journal of Economic Perspectives from 2011 had a great title: "Economics and Emigration: Trillion Dollar Bills on the Sidewalk." And I think, in part because of that fantastic title, it has gotten a lot of response. It's been cited. You know, probably hundreds of times in lots of different articles, you know, support or or trying to oppose it or whatever. Um, but aside from the very attention getting title, the thesis of the article is that restricting emigration from poor countries is actually the greatest impediment to economic growth in the world, and could have far greater economic benefits if we were to you know free up more immigration than all international trade and investment. Now, that's a pretty bold thesis. Tell us about this research and what, first of all, where, where, why you started doing it and sort of the impact of this thesis and this discussion on immigration and migration studies. Thank you so much. I, I, I'm talking about the title. I, I once heard the conservative Bill Buckley say that the uh, liberal John Kenneth Galbraith's books were, quote, best enjoyed for their prose, unquote. So if you if you have somebody say you have a great title that that uh, 
I, I don't know what to think about that. But anyway, <laughs> in, in the in the article it, it, itself, I'm just talking about this idea that that talent is universal and opportunity is not. That has a, a very uh, powerful implication, which is that the the economic contribution that many people can make is limited by where they are. People who just live within the economy don't often think of a person's earnings as the contribution that they're making. But of course, that's what it is. Uh, almost every employer doesn't give us wages because it, as an act of charity, they give us wages because we, uh, as workers, are adding value to their capital. They take a share of it and w workers take a share of it. And uh, in that sense, your earnings are a measure of what you're contributing to the economy. So a, a, a person in, in Malawi who earns uh, one twentieth of what a comparable person in the United States uh, could make is certainly earning less and has less opportunities for themselves. So that makes people think of these differences often in terms of fairness or, or, or justice. And, and that, that's fine. I don't, I'm not criticizing that. I'm just not talking about that. I'm mm -hmm. talking about what relative earnings around the world imply in terms of the contribution you can make to the global economy. And the global economy is not a pile of stuff on the ground where people just take stuff from it. And when there are more people taking stuff, everybody gets less stuff. An economy isn't that. An economy is a spectacularly complex web of interactions through which all of us specialize in different stuff, exchange with each other, and make each other better off. That's what an economy is. And barriers to those interactions generally reduce the size of the economy. They, they make the, the whole economy poorer. The clearest way I have ever found to, to give an entry point to, to uh, this idea is female labor force participation in the United States, which has shot up uh, over the last century from something like 15% of women to uh, something like 70% uh, like, uh, of women. And uh, what did that do? to men. Well, certainly it meant more competition for jobs that men exclusively used to hold. Uh, at the beginning of that time, almost all doctors, lawyers, uh, business people were men and not women. However, female labor force entry enormously benefited men uh, through specialization. Women start businesses, women make patents, women uh, consume products uh, made by men uh, that aren't identical to the products consumed by men themselves, which creates more opportunity for specialization, entrepreneurship, and, and growth of the economy. Women do all kinds of things that uh, end up uh, benefiting both men and women by their greater range of interactions. The same thing happens with immigrants to a country. Immigrants start businesses. Immigrants innovate. Immigrants specialize in different tasks within occupations. Everybody has been to a, to a restaurant uh, at, at least one restaurant in the United States where the people in the back kitchen are more likely to be from other countries and the people waiting the tables are more likely to need absolutely fluent English and they're specializing in different stuff together, creating a unit of the economy, which is that restaurant. And when you take a step back and think about uh, the world where in, in some countries the labor force is shrinking. Germany's labor force is shrinking. Japan's labor force is shrinking. In Korea, where uh, the total fertility rate uh, is now 0 0.72, whereas it takes 2.1 to keep a constant population, uh, there are fewer and fewer workers in some of the high-income countries where migrants go. In countries where migrants come from, there are more and more workers. And that's an opportunity for mutual benefit really mutual benefit and 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 it's a necessary opportunity for mutual benefits that we don't have a world notwithstanding all the ai floating around where you can have economic growth without workers and we're not going to have one for a very long time so with that, what that paper trillion dollar bills on the sidewalk is about is is about trying to measure what is the global cost to the world collectively of the migration barriers we have and if you, if you think about what the cost to the U.S. economy was from preventing more specialization by women in things that they were naturally suited to do, you, you can easily start thinking about what the global cost of keeping people in poor countries without opportunities that match their talents uh, is for all of us.
Yeah. So it's the classic gl growing the pie argument, right? We, yes. If the pie is fixed, then yes, more people means more competition for the pie pieces. But if the pie is getting bigger as more people are coming in, then everybody can keep the same, at least the same amount of pie, if not more. You know, one of the things we had, uh, Jason Wendell, who's a global development impact investor uh, on this podcast last, and he, he was saying that, you know, migration not only benefits the immigrants, but it, it has development opportunities in home because those skills that immigrants invest in that enable them to migrate tend to be replicated with people who don't migrate. Like they also gain those skills and whether or not they choose to leave, those skills then do actually help where they're at. And the, as you mentioned, the connections between the home country and the diaspora um, can create trade opportunities, can create investment opportunities that can benefit both countries. So there's the sense that immigration is absolutely, you know, a, a zero sum game, a person leaves here and enters somewhere else, and there's a hole left where they left and, you know, another mouth to feed in the new place, like, that's maybe oversimplistic. Um, and I think that's something that people don't don't always think about. It's not simplistic. It's been extensively documented. So one thing that we have at the global level is extremely detailed data on every single uh, product that every country uh, produces and exports down to, you know, hats made from a particular material. Uh, and e economists, uh, Danny Bahar and Hillel Rappaport, this incredible study where they put together that detailed data on trade, not just on the amount of trade, but on the incredibly detailed products that each country produces and exports and migration. And unsurprisingly, very poor countries like Malawi uh, don't produce and export most of the categories of products that exist in the world. They just don't have a, a developed and specialized economy enough to do that. But they asked it, a question, well, in some years, countries start to produce and export fine categories of products that they never produced and exported before. Somebody uh, innovated in that country. Somebody created a new business making a particular kind of felt hat and exporting it to the world that nobody had done before. How did that happen? And they showed that increases in the size of a country's diaspora, the number of migrants abroad in countries that do already make and export that product uh, cause a large increase in the percent chance that the country of migrant origin starts to produce and export that project, pro that product. In other words, knowledge about how to diversify the economy, grow the economy, uh, make a more developed economy isn't just in the air. It's not on the internet where you just Google, how do I make felt hats? <laughs> it travels through people yeah. and, and, and that only happens through migration. And that, that is a crucial, that is one of many crucial conduits by which migration develops economies at home. Yeah. So this kind of leads to my next question, because your research focuses a great deal on the effects and impacts of various types of restrictive migration policies. Many other researchers focus on the benefits of increased immigration, the impact of immigrants already present. For example, you researched the economic impact of restrictions on Mexican agricultural workers, the birth, end of the Bracero program, and the impact that had on American agriculture industry. Why do you focus on what may be some seed to be kind of the flip side, right? You're, you're maybe an inverse argument. You're, you're researching the effect of restrictions to argue in favor of more openness. How do you see that kind of differentiating the work you do from maybe some of the other work that's in this, in this space? There are all kinds of scientists in the world. There's, there, there, are, there are mathematicians who just want to pursue truth and beauty in their offices, and I love that. And there are other scientists who want to change the world. And their economists are just like that. There are many economists who want to do research to publish in journals and, and to, to discover great theoretical truths. And there are economists who, who want to inform policymakers. And I, I'm with Nobel laureate Friedrich Hayek and lots of other economists who, who have, have put a, a central role in informing policy. And migration isn't a policy. Migration is not something that the government does to families. Uh, families migrate. Uh, for all kinds of reasons uh, at all kinds of, of places and times. And the government uh, does shape that uh, decision uh, mostly through barriers of various kinds, giving you hoops to jump through, making you qualify for, for certain permissions to do it. And if what you study is what is the overall effect of all immigration on the entire U.S. economy, and then a policymaker comes to you and says, uh, 
what should the H two B visa quota be uh, next uh, uh, in the second half of next fiscal year? Uh, you, you have nothing to say to them. Right. That, that that the first piece of research is not informative about the policy question. Mm-hmm. Uh, however, uh, increasingly, there's a there's a group of economists who are studying the impact of specific policy changes, the elimination of the uh, Mexican farm worker Bracero program uh, under the, the the Johnson administration at the end of 1964 was one of those things that that I and my co-authors studied to ask uh, did it achieve its effects? Uh, it, it, did it achieve its intended effect? Uh, and John F. Kennedy explicitly stated, "We are going to get rid of this thing in order to create more." jobs and higher wages for U.S. farm workers, did that happen? And that's a, that's a thing which is not really, in my view, a, a, a political stance. It's, it's a fact about the world that you can investigate with data and ask if it happened. Mm-hmm. And what did you find? So we, we compare uh, states that were heavily affected by the Bracero exclusion, uh, like Arizona and, and Texas, where there were lots of Braceros, to other states that were essentially unaffected by it because there weren't Braceros there, like Vermont. Uh, were there different trends in in uh, employment or wages of U.S. farm workers in those places? And we didn't find any uh, at all. And both our and subsequent research has confirmed that what happened instead was that the Bracero exclusion a massively increased mechanization of U.S. agriculture. Essentially, those workers were replaced uh, by machines uh, and not by other workers. So that's a that's a complexity that the that the, the the many people Kennedy and Johnson and many others who who worked for years to eliminate the Rosero program uh, uh, had not thought about. Yeah, it's it's going back to something we said earlier about the the economy being very dynamic and complex. The assumption that the only response to restrictions in workers is, you know, restrictions in foreign workers is to hire more U.S. workers when employers do have other options in many cases, one of which is mechanization, another which maybe we just won't grow crops that require so many people, you know, crop specialization, or, you know, some farmers have said farming's not for me anymore and they stop farming. And that doesn't necessarily create more jobs for Americans you know, that's, it's sort of, again, I think if there's a theme we're seeing here, it's that oversimplistic understandings of how the economy actually works can result in policies that don't achieve intended ends or worse, achieve negative ends. So it's something for us to think about. We're going to take a quick break right here, but when we come back, we'll talk about the importance of data transparency to evaluating migration policies. So stay tuned. And welcome back. So, Michael, in in our discussion to prepare for this episode, you and I spoke about some of the challenges in accessing government data to evaluate different policies. And you've worked with governments around the world and other international organizations. Are there some commonalities to this data challenge? We we could talk for hours about that. I mean, what, one big one is is the the people coming to the border right now. Uh, there, there's no government data set about asylum seekers. If you ask uh, how many people uh, are in the United States uh, right now uh, who who are seeking asylum, what are their ages? What are their education levels? What are they doing as a job? Uh, what fraction of them have lawful employment authorization? Th- those numbers don't exist. And in a in a in a black box like that, all kinds of narratives flourish. I've often wished that it would just greatly contribute to the quality of the public discussion about the border and about the role of recent immigration in the U.S. economy and U.S. future if we just knew more about who those folks are. And it's just not just a regular migration, but at a global level, even regular migration is, is hard to study. You get into many situations of data that are not comparable. Uh, just yesterday, I was putting together statistics about immigration in the U.S. and Japan, for example. And uh, the U.S. doesn't regularly publish statistics on immigration by citizenship. The, the The main concept of immigration in most government statistics is is birthplace. Are you foreign born right. or not foreign born? Right. The opposite in Japan. They they don't publish much data on birthplace, but they do on on citizens versus non citizens, uh, and it makes a big difference. Like the fraction of the U.S. workforce that's foreign-born is uh, something like 19% now. Mm-hmm. Uh, the fraction of the 
workforce that is a foreign citizen is is half that. Mm-hmm. Uh, so it, it just, even even asking very basic questions uh, around the world is, is hard and, and takes a specialist days to put together the numbers. And that's that's not something that most people have the time to do. Yeah, it's also true that the the government data tends to be in arrears, right? Yes. So one of the things that's difficult, if we just look at arrivals at the border, it's very difficult to sort of make predictions about what arrivals will look like next month. Because by the time we receive the last month's data, we're already partway into the current month. And so we don't know what's changed in that intervening time or to see new trends developing. So you have to kind of dig deep into the last several months of data to see, oh, look, this this nationality, for example, that was tiny six months ago has been steadily increasing. And so you might project that there's a steady increase here. This is something we should watch out for. We might see a larger number in the future of Ecuadorians or Peruvians or Chinese or whatever. Um, but you have to dive pretty deep into the, the data going back to find that. And then you have to sort of say, okay, well, what do we think this might mean for the, for the future? Um, as you said, the categorization and how data is um, is described from one place to another, you know, even within Department of Homeland Security, there's a whole office, the Office of Homeland Security Statistics now that used to be the Office of Immigration Statistics, that is one of their jobs is to take different data from USCIS, CBP, and ICE and try to merge it together to have a continuum of understanding of how a person travels from entry to the country to benefits to maybe enforcement and then back out. And that's an incredibly difficult challenge because each agency collects data in different ways for its own purposes that don't necessarily reflect what another agency might find useful or leadership might find useful or frankly, public or researchers might find useful. So they don't they don't know somebody would care about the specific education levels of asylum seekers, for example. Um, so they're not bothering to collect that. That may only come out in some future census data, which doesn't ask about people's immigration status, so we don't know that either. So you have to like do this jigsaw puzzle of different data sets, and can we can we take the information from this data set and the information of this data set and do some sort of crosswalk or imputed crosswalk to figure this all out? The people who estimate the status of the undocumented you know, start with census data and then subtract out what they know of immigration data and then, you know, actuarial tables of how many people might die or leave and and then make some estimate. It's very complicated. And I, I, I'm i very um, in awe of those people who, like yourself, who who take those giant data sets and try to try to do that. Thank you for being such a data nerd. I, I just I, the only kind of podcast I want to be on is one where the the phrase "imputed crosswalk" comes up. I like you know I uh, the, a good example of what you're just talking about are the, are the quiet heroes at the Congressional Budget Office who who do who aren't often in the public eye but do incredibly important work. And one of the things they need to know to make their projections is what's the size of the U.S. workforce. Uh, and for that reason, they have been making estimates of how many people have been arriving at the southwest border and are likely to stay and be a part of the U.S. workforce, part of the U.S. population, part of even future generations of Americans. And what they found was that the data at the border and the data from the census and the data from establishment firm surveys all all show very different things. And they've been wrestling with the how to put those together and get a good idea of just what the basic facts on the ground are. And as you said, you know, month by month in real time is very important. But here we're even talking about like the last two years, what yeah. what has been happening is not something that is transparent to policymakers. Yeah. And, and I, I share your um, estimation of the CBO investigators because through some interactions I had, they, they I learned that they had actually went to DHS and asked for the detailed data of the number of people who were released into the country and and paroled and made some estimates about how many people were likely to get work authorization if they didn't have it immediately and things like that mm-hmm. all of which added to their estimations that you know over the last couple of years something like 2 to 3 million new immigrants had arrived which was not something that even the census had yet kind of grasped onto and they used that to make their their future population projections and so again immigration and data nerd that I am, saw that and went, hey, 
<laughs> you know, when I saw that in February, they had their new projections out and I saw this graph and I went, wait a minute, uh, they recognize something here that no one else had yet caught on with. And it's been circulating vastly around the immigration world. And I think even the economics world that this, this new kind of understanding and estimate has come out. So think about how weird that is. I mean, the, the <laughs> people at CBO are wonderful and I know and love them, but, but uh, the, the fact that, that our best idea of how, how much de facto immigration has been happening over the last two years is coming not from anywhere else in the government, but from the Congressional Budget, Budget Office, Office is yeah. a little bit odd. It, it is it's odd. Not, it's not impugning them. It's just, it's just not necessarily the, the, the division of labor that you'd come up with if you were thinking, what's a, what's a good system for making immigration transparent in America? Yeah. And, and I will say that it's interesting in the United States. Um, I lived and worked in Canada for quite a few years. And Canada has an official government agency called Statistics Canada, whose job is to calculate all kinds of statistics about all kinds of things across the federal government. We do not have a central statistical agency in the United States. So you, if you want to find statistics on any given thing, uh, Commerce Department has statistics, uh, Labor Department has statistics, uh, Census Bureau has statistics, Small Business Administration has statistics, DHS has statistics. Um, yes. It's very, you know, it's very decentralized. And so you have to do a lot of digging to find what can be useful information. You don't always know where you're, where to look or where it, you're going to, you're going to find it. Um, but let me ask you a, a, another question. What do you think is some of the most important migration data that is, quote, still missing for the public or for researchers like you, that you would really love to get your hands on that you just can't find? I mean, this this is another one where uh, uh, we could talk all day. Much greater clarity on on the status of people who have been recently arriving uh, and and are now staying in the country. Uh, how many of them uh, have parole? Mm -hmm. How many of the people in the country now have parole? What fraction of those uh, are going to have their parole expire uh, next year? Uh, what is any trait of them? How many of them are employed? Uh, where exactly are they living? How many of them may have filed for asylum? How many have, have applied for asylum? We don't exactly. Know. <laughs> how many have gotten employment authorization? Uh, how many of them have have lapsed into being unlawfully present, even though they uh, many of them, as I pointed out, absolutely are not unlawfully present at the moment. That that's just a that's a total black box for the public, and a lot of uh, uh, narratives flourish when there's no light being shined on the subject. Something that I've uh, often wished for is uh, is a greater understanding of transit migration, mm. uh, by which I mean migration not from one's country of origin, but via another country. So a, a big example was the, the large number of Haitians who appeared at uh, Del Rio, Texas uh, in, in uh, 2021. Many of those people were coming not from Haiti directly, but from other countries, a substantial number from Chile, other countries into which they had been displaced sometimes years before. And there's just no way to understand that phenomenon unless you know where people are departing from. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and there, there isn't a data source for that. There, there's no, when, when somebody is encountered at the U.S. border, their nationality is recorded, but uh, their place of prior residence is occasionally asked about, but is usually not recorded. And we just don't know that much about that. There's a, there, there's a whole lot of narratives about, uh, about, the relationship between immigrants and crime. Mm -hmm. uh, not many, uh, very few jurisdictions collect uh, data on any kind of criminal activity or incarceration that are uh, specific to immigration status. Uh, there's some data from Texas that people have That's used. That's another agency that collects statistics is DOJ, <laughs> Department of Justice. Absolutely. <laughs> but not great uh, statistics, but, uh, as you just mentioned. That not great for the purposes that people uh, uh, have tried to use them for, right. and, and a, a, a few limited data sources that exist have been uh, pushed and pulled in various ways. But the, but it's 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 generally difficult to firmly establish in the data basic questions like are people who don't have a lawful immigration status in this country more likely or less likely to to commit crimes mm -hmm. uh, of various kinds uh, and. There, there is uh, research that uses uh, less direct methods than just looking in, in the data to make assessments about that. And that tends to find that, that immigrants of all kinds, including those without legal authorization, tend to reduce rates of, of, of violent and property crime. Mm -hmm. But it's an, it's an area where 
of a lot of public controversy. And one of the root causes of that controversy is is just data opacity. So yeah. that that would be on my wish list and, and many others. Yeah. So most of your work uses sort of empirical data and looks at historical policies. Um, and as we mentioned earlier, others kind of are doing modeling or imputing data. Why do you take that particular approach? Oh, gosh, because because I've seen what the alternative is. I mean, uh, the U.S. has a long history with all kinds of immigration policies. Uh, U.S. is a is a great country, which, like every country, has chapters in the book which are dark. And one of those was eighty three years of Chinese exclusion, uh, forty eight years of exclusion of everybody but Japanese, and forty one years of all Asians, including Japanese. Was that's part of our history, and uh, all sorts of factual claims were made to justify those laws about the effects of Asian workers on the labor market, about the integration of Asians into U.S. society, about their support for democracy, about their uh, propensity to carry disease and all kinds of other statements that you can find uh, made by across the political spectrum, conservatives and liberals right there in the U.S. Congress over many generations. And they weren't they were based on all kinds of feels and uh, and and anecdotes and and uh, concepts that had nothing to do with data. And we, we we live in a very different world now. You can you can learn facts about immigration. You can treat it as a feature of the world that it's possible to learn about scientifically. And, and that's what I vastly prefer to do. Yeah. Um, in our prep call, we also talked about probably one of the most famous studies of the impact of immigration based on a historical precedent, and that is the, the studies over the wage impacts and job impacts of the Mariel boat left. Um, oh, gosh. You know, sort of starting with uh, Berkeley economist, David, labor economist David Card, um, and then later revisited by uh, Harvard economist George Borjas, and still kind of tit for tatting back and forth about whether or not that was uh, an accurate study. But, um, you know, a lot of the criticisms or, or if you will, the, the controversy surrounds sort of assumptions made um, and, and also sort of the relevance of that study of a particular period in time and a particular incident to generalize to a larger question, which is, do, does the arrival of immigrants impact the wages or jobs of native born workers? And what you and I talked about is that the challenge with using that particular incident, and maybe I, I'd welcome your comparison to your research on the Bracera program, is that that was a point in time, right? You had a large number of immigrants arriving at a particular point in time in a particular location, and we're trying to say that the impact then can be imputed to be, I'm using the word again, or inferred to be the same as the impact of any migration arrivals over any period of time now or in the future. And, you know, not trying to say anything about the reputations of David Card or George Borjas, but there is something, you know, going back to what we were talking about earlier, the paucity of data leads people to try to do these kinds of experiments or look at these kinds of models to try to make a larger claim when at the end of the day, maybe we can't support it. So if we're talking about immigrants and crime, if we don't have really just the right data, we're taking these other data and trying to say, we can look at that data and think that it means this. What's your sense of sort of that, you know, when we look at sort of the economics and research around impacts of migration, there are these kind of two, I don't want to say schools, but but different kind of methodologies, right? Like, like, what can we say about what the data shows us? And what are we kind of saying, data only shows us this, but we think that it really means this, <laughs> if, you could, if that makes sense. Yes. Uh, uh, Mariel Bodlift is another thing we could talk about all day. I, I wrote a study of that with uh, one of the world's leading immigration economists, who is Jennifer Hunt of Rutgers University. Uh, what was the Mariel Bodlift? Mariel Bodlift was a a surge in migration from Cuba to the United States concentrated in Miami in 1980. It was the product of a one-off agreement between uh, Jimmy Carter and Fidel Castro. And economists got interested in it because it meant a almost a 10% increase overnight in the supply of labor for low-skill jobs in Miami. So, so David Card, who later got a Nobel Prize uh, in, in part for this research, uh, at, wanted to ask, well, uh, can we use this to can we compare what happened in Miami to U.S. workers? 
to what happened in other similar cities that didn't get this shock to learn more about immigration. Set aside what David Card and George Borjas found for a second, and let's just say that they both found horrible effects on U.S. workers. We're talking about a almost 10% increase in the labor supply in one year, actually in just a few months, but mm -hmm. let's say it's in the year mm -hmm. of 1980, normal immigration to the U.S. at the time was 0.3% of the population. Right. So it's this is a 30 times now. shock. It's not too much higher now. This is a, a, a huge shock, a 30x shock mm -hmm. uh, relative to normal immigration. So if I were to tell you, hey, look, George Borjas and David Card agree that taking 60 Tylenol will <laughs> make you sick or kill you. Yeah. That is not informative about what taking two Tylenol will do. Mm -hmm. So, so we just we need to keep in perspective, as you rightly pointed out, what this study, what this uh, very abnormal situation can teach us. But what did they actually find? Uh, there's a lot of misconceptions about that. They both found that for workers uh, with high school or less, there was a positive effect on wages. Positive wages went up more in Miami than they went up in comparison cities that didn't get it high school or less, mm -hmm. low-skill U.S. workers. They both found uh, uh, even when separating high school only and less than high school, they found no effect on employment, no effect on jobs, mm -hmm. no substitution of U.S. workers for Cuban workers. What they disagreed about was not just what happened to the wages of the least skilled workers with less than high school, but just for, and I have to say this carefully, male, less than high school, prime age, non-Hispanic mm -hmm. workers. Mm -hmm. So the comparison so was, keep a, that in, was a specific group. We're talking about, in, in, I mean, right now, the, the high school dropout rate in the United States is 4.1%. That means the, for males, uh, it, it's the, the fraction of, of the new cohort of workers in the United States uh, who are male high school dropouts is something like 2%. Mm -hmm. When you take out Hispanics, uh, you're getting down towards one and a half percent. This is a very, very, very small sliver of the labor market. That's what they're disagreeing about. And uh, what, what Jennifer Hunt and I pointed out was that there was a, a mistake in Borja's study. Uh, he was using census data whose composition changed in 1980. Mm -hmm. It shot up for some reason from, uh, from one uh, third black to 90% black right at the same time. And that sample does not include any Cubans. Mm. So uh, it, it was not that black Cubans were coming in. It was something else was happening. And because blacks in Miami typically earned less, there was a fall in, in wages. So it, it, it turned out at the end of the day that to, 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 uh, to get really technical for two seconds, uh, it, he had to assume that the relationship between uh, being black and earnings for the least skilled workers was identical in Miami to the, what it was in the rest of the cities that didn't get this shock. It wasn't. Mm -hmm. uh, if you assume that, you get his result. If you don't assume that, which wasn't true, then, then th there wasn't even, a, even an effect on the wages of this tiny sliver of the labor market. However, just, just cast aside that technical discussion and really ask yourself uh, uh, whether the study of a 30x shock to a, to a, to a little labor market in, in 1980 is informative about any specific policy question. Yeah. And here we get back to what we talked about before of it's just much more useful to study, uh, say, a change in the H-2B visa quota or a change in the refugee ceiling and ask what effects uh, that had or, or, or didn't have than to imagine that there's something in general called immigration out there and we can understand whether immigration is good or bad. Mm -hmm. I don't believe that's possible. Yeah. Um, you know, it's, it, this kind of goes back to our conversations about the, the crime rates. Some of this is because we don't have great data, Right. You know, if you're trying to take this, you know, one time event that was an abnormal labor shock that has not, to my knowledge, been replicated since, um, really, and, and trying to, you know, again, compare that to other cities where you have mixed data sets and you're trying, you know, some of them are tiny data sets. And what can you really say about that? It goes back to how much data do you have and how useful is that data and what are you trying to make that data say versus what it actually can tell you. And I think that's 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 a big challenge anytime. And maybe one of the reasons why the public kind of turns off all the data conversations. It's just, it's hard, people. <laughs> there was a, a little replication that I'll just briefly mention, which is a, a, a economist Giovanni Petty of, of University of California, Davis, and, and, a, and a collaborators that I, I can't remember, uh, 
studied uh, the surge of Puerto Ricans into mainland U.S. Right. after Hurricane Maria. Yeah. And uh, for a disproportionate number of them went to Orlando, Florida. Mm -hmm. So he, he used that like a, like a 2015 version of yeah. the 1980 study saying when you have a surge of Caribbean migrants into a, a different Florida city, mm -hmm. uh, what happened? And he found no effect on overall wages. He found that construction wages went down because a lot of them worked in construction. He found that retail wages went up because they were also consuming stuff and going to stores and buying stuff. And the net effect was uh, of, of that complexity was no effect on labor market opportunities for yeah. mainland U.S. workers. Yeah. So last question, uh, going forward, what do you think are the most important aspects, economic aspects of migration for policymakers to understand? Wow. Uh, I wish that more policymakers uh, understood that for people coming from poor countries, migration is, is an investment uh, and not a location choice uh, fundamentally. And that means that increased opportunities at home have complex effects on, on decisions to migrate. And it's just not the case that for all its bipartisan appeal, uh, development of poor migrant origin countries is going to somehow cut off migration. We just don't have any evidence of that in the historical record. Usually as countries successfully develop, they have more migration and they have that for decades or generations. So that's not a kind of get out of jail free card. I wish that more people understood the paucity of lawful channels for people to cross the border. Thinking about one data point of fiscal 2022 some of the most important countries at the border, which have been uh, Cuba, Haiti, Nicaragua, Venezuela, and Northern Central America, if you just count up the number of migrant encounters in 2022 uh, for people from those countries and compare it to the number of visas that existed, those people were all in inadmissible because they didn't have a visa. Well, how many visas were there? Uh, you cannot get past uh, three visas per hundred uh, people actually encountered at the border. Uh, and 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 I include in that calculation, by the way, H one B high skill visa, O one alien of extraordinary yeah. ability visas that are totally irrelevant to most of those people. Yeah. There just aren't visas. So if you want to know the root causes of chaos at the border, uh, one of them is uh, our collective refusal to expand lawful pathways. Mm -hmm. I've said on the show before, I worked at Department of Homeland Security during the uh, second half of the Obama administration and the, the uh, sorry, the second half of the Bush administration, the first half of the Obama administration, two different secretaries of Homeland Security, two different parties, both of whom charged with securing the border, both of whom testified before Congress, if you want me to secure the border, give me more legal visas. They understood that. The Americans understand that. There's, there's a, a Pew Research uh, a nationwide uh, poll recently asking people about various policy changes at the border, and clearly some kind of major policy change at the border is coming. Would that make the situation better or worse? And 56% of American adults said that more lawful opportunities to migrate would make the, the situation better. So the, the, it's not some sort of uh, crazy idea. I think it's something that pragmatic people understand. It's something that people living at the border understand. They just want it to be done carefully, and, and they want a lot more order and a lot more rule of law at the border. And uh, lawful channels alongside enforcement are, are a recipe for that. Well, I think we will leave it there. We'll have links to Michael's bio and some of the articles that we've mentioned in our show notes. Michael, thank you so much for joining us today on This Week in Immigration. Thank you. It was a real pleasure. And that's a wrap on this episode of This Week in Immigration. One last reminder to subscribe, rate, and review this podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or your favorite podcast platform, and share it with your friends and colleagues. You can also find our podcast episodes on the Bipartisan Policy Center YouTube channel. You can find more information on all the issues we discuss here on the show, at bipartisanpolicy.org slash immigration. You can follow the Bipartisan Policy Center on the X platform at BPC underscore bipartisan. You can follow Teresa Cardinal Brown at BPC underscore T Brown. And you can follow me at Jack Malday. Send your comments and feedback to us by email to immigration at bipartisanpolicy.org. I'm Jack Malday. This Week in Immigration was created and executive produced by Teresa Cardinal Brown. This episode was written by myself and Teresa Cardinal Brown. Joshua Joe is our audio editor. The executive producer of BBC Podcasts is Lucy Manning. Talk to you next time on This Week in Immigration. Mm -hmm.